Yeah, this seems to work. Good. Yes. So, yeah, welcome. Uh, my little talk about why is Go becoming so popular? So what does it set apart from other programming languages? And this is not so much uh, now a talk about everything totally objective or so. A lot is my experience can be personal. And uh, I'm happy to have a discussion afterwards and hear your experience from other programming languages, right? So this is uh, more to lay a um, foundation of uh, some basic knowledge and then we can have a nice chat afterwards. So a little bit of me, I'm around for quite a while, uh, done a lot of Java, now Go, co organizing this meetup. And now we have our first Go code. And it's very simple, just want to read a file, right? The content of the file, we have this file here, test data, hello.txt, we want to read that. There's an OS package with a, a function read file. And we get back the content of the file plus an error. And if the error, is no, then we have a real error. We have to handle it. Yeah, we simply lock fatal. Fatal exits the whole process, right? You have to be careful with that. Should only be allowed within main methods and main functions. Um, and afterwards, I just print the content of the file, right? This is pretty simple. Um, the OS package only has this read file function from 1.16 on. I have to warn you. In older versions, uh, this function, the exact same function exists too, but it is in IO slash IO util. And it still exists there for compatibility, but you shouldn't use it uh, anymore if you write new software. So I'm nice here and uh, use the one from OS. That's the new proper version. Well, you can see it looks probably familiar from people who have been using like uh, other programming languages, or possibly scripting languages or so. It's not too, too crazy, right? But it's quite boring, right? I mean, you can read file in a similar way in almost any programming language, right? And uh, JavaScript is a bit of an exception because it only offers asynchronous I.O., which has it, uh, its advantages. We will talk about that in a minute. And it looks a bit between a scripting language and a traditional compiled language, right? There weren't many type definitions around and so on. So, yeah. Um, what would be cool instead? So asynchronous I.O. is needed for high scalability, right? And that's what JavaScript is doing only. And uh, of course, you want to perform other tasks while waiting for the I.O., otherwise it wouldn't make much sense, right? And um, you don't want long garbage collection breaks, right? But uh, want to be able to offer something with low latency and so on. And the cool thing is Go does all this behind the scenes, right? The Go runtime underneath is converting this to asynchronous IO. It looks totally boring, synchronous code, but it is asynchronous IO underneath. And it runs other uh, code other Go routines, they are called in, in Go, as uh, in parallel, right? When while waiting for the I.O. So we don't need any callback or reactive libraries or, or anything, right? It's just very simple, totally easy to think about code. And the same goes uh, for network I.O., of course, and similar things. So under the hood, everything is asynchronous and go, but you never see it, right? You never have to deal with that yourself, no callbacks or whatever else. 
And yeah, this enables high throughput and, and low latency services. But this is really the magic uh, behind Go, why uh, so many parts of the cloud are built in Go because they are um, low latency, uh, yeah, TCP or HTTP services usually. And to handle high throughput and shouldn't take too much overhead, right? So, um, and in this way, Go is very simple because you don't have to do all these things explicitly, but this is just done for you. And um, yeah, we can see how far we can get with something a bit more complex like implementing a kind of Google search, right? This is a simplified version, of course. So a search is simply something where you get a query, like the query string that you type, and then you get a string result here, yeah, right? Usually it would be more complex, of course, but we simplify this to a string result. And uh, the thing is, uh, Google to uh, give uh, return a result quick, uh, they have multiple replicas, right? They have multiple servers who do exactly the same thing, have exactly the same data, and uh, they are queried in parallel. And uh, then in practice, you just take the first result and the others you simply ignore. This is a bit of waste of resources, of course, but um, it, it makes everything way uh, smoother and you don't have uh, high latency spikes and so on. That is a full talk about this example where you can see uh, in this how this uh, changes things and so on. And this is quite helpful in practice too. So. Uh, what we do for this is we create a channel for the strings. This is the other string results. And then um, we say one search replica is a function uh, of the index. And then uh, the implementation takes the replica with that index and uh, applies the query to it, right? And the resulting string, uh, the string here returned, is uh, written into this channel that we set up here. And so uh, we do a, a for loop now um, over all the replicas that are given here, right? So we don't have to do a for I equals zero and so on, but you can range over the replicas. Yeah, similar with uh, maps and so on. And then we start this go routine. That's what I uh, told you. These are these very lightweight uh, routines that can run in parallel. And they are way more lightweight than threads even. So, um, and the operating system is handling um, processes uh, mostly, and then processes can have many threads, which are a lot more lightweight than processes already. But they switching threads is still costing something, and you can't handle much more than three thousand threads in parallel, effectively at least, and. Um, with these uh, Go routines, you can do a lot more. And they are extremely lightweight and, and uh, the switching is, is extremely efficient. And that's why the, um, the Go runtime can do this behind the scenes uh, without anyone noticing or having a measurable uh, effect. And yeah, then it just, uh, it starts all these Go routines, right? And they run in parallel. 
and we simply read one result from the channel, just the first, and return it. And that's it, right? Uh, all the cleanup of the memory, all the other go routines, and the other results, and everything is done by the garbage collector, which does uh, only is very quick and does only very very small pauses for the whole uh, program. So they are less than one milliseconds, even for very big uh, heaps. And now with this function, we want to do the Google search, kind of, right? We get the query and get multiple results back because we don't only want to have um, web results, but image results too and videos, right? And for this, we make a channel again and uh, we start a function this is a function literal and uh, we write the the result of the uh, call to first which is a string uh, into this channel and is a channel of strings so this is working out nicely and we have three web searches here right we want web search is the most important. So we have uh, many replicas for that. And for image search and video search, we have only two replicas. And uh, run those in parallel. And then we set a timeout um, and say after 80 milliseconds, we want to stop. Right. And then we, we just use what we have until then. So we want to have all three results. Yeah, we do this classical C-like for loop because we really want three results if possible. And um, whenever we get something from the channel, we appended to the overall results that are returned up here. And uh, when we get a timeout after 80 milliseconds, uh, yeah, we notice, so we can test how often this happens and uh, return the results that we got until then. Most likely there's a web search within because we have one replica more, but yeah. We don't know exactly, right? We just say, okay, the user won't wait any longer. So we just return now. And usually uh, we get three results because we have enough replicas and then we return all three results. This is done down here, right? When the for loop ends uh, the natural way. Yeah, so this is something quite sophisticated that you can do in like one screen full of Go code, right? And this is quite uh, unique about it. And, and the reason, uh, one of the reasons why it is so popular, especially in the, in the cloud world. Um, yeah, timeouts are nowadays handled with help of the standard library with the context package uh, that's helping with that. Um, other resilience patterns are usually implemented in open source libraries and they use similar approach that uh, we just saw in this little example. And um, the yeah, other features. In general, this is a bit of a difference in culture. Uh, to Java, especially, I think, uh, layers of extraction, we, we don't like them in Go, right? We try to get as down to the metal as possible without feeling the, the hard spikes or something, right? We, it should still feel from the outside uh, nice and, and easy to use, um, but it should otherwise be as close to the metal as possible. And yeah, most of the standard library, uh, I think that I've debugged and, and uh, 
looked into how it's working internally was only one to maximum three calls deep. So often uh, the, the library methods and functions are just one call, right? And sometimes you have uh, that the real implementation is in something handled by something more general than you have two. And, and uh, quite rarely do you have some help by utility things, but often you can get quite far with, with two uh, calls deep in the library. You find the interesting parts usually, and three is already quite a lot. Um, yeah, I never had to debug more than five calls deep into any dependency so far. This is, I find this really refreshing, right? It, at least my Java days, I had sometimes more, something like 50 uh, calls deep. And yeah, so you could get lost in there. And this is way easier to track back and to understand for me. And most functions still fit on a single screen. So they aren't that difficult to reason about either. And yeah, that's, um, even the heart of the runtime system that's doing these switches between go routines and so on, it's relatively simple. We once had a talk about it uh, at this meetup quite right some time ago. Um, but as I remember, it was kind of two screens full of code and you needed a bit of background uh, how these Go routines are uh, what they are called internally and what else are there because they are mapped to threads and so on. And um, but once uh, you get this set up and uh, you could understand this relatively easily. And I would say after that, a few hours. And so within a day, you can fully understand it and possibly find a bug. And yeah, I, I wouldn't try and do this in the JVM or even in the, in the Python uh, runtime or, or compiler. Um, hopefully it's not needed, right? Um, yeah, bugs and dependencies can be quite easily discovered. I did this once or twice. Uh, once in, by accident, I just was looking at the implementation, how something interesting has been done. And then a few lines up, I saw something and thought, oh, this looks odd. And uh, yeah, and it was a bug. And I handed in the fix half an hour later. and. The next day, I was officially committed to this <laughs> cool uh, open source project. This was funny. Um, and it's, it's not too much work or so, right? It's, of course, a bit of uh, luck thing. But yeah, it's good tradition to do this in the Go work, right? In the old days, it, most people have done this uh, every now and then. Nowadays, most libraries are uh, quite good uh, state and you have a hard time to find uh, a bug. And yeah, so this is not so much that everybody's doing it, but still when you find something, don't hesitate. It's not uh, so intimidating or something. It's not that too big, such a big thing. So yeah, that's it from my side, really. Thank you. And yeah, we can open the discussion. I stop sharing first. Um, I can see you. And if we still need something, I will share again, right? So, yeah, thanks. Thank you very listening. much. And, yeah, thanks. That was interesting. Yeah. From my point of view, the whole. Uh, I, like I started using Go 2011, 2012, somewhere around then, and it was just the sheer simplicity. Like I came from .NET, and you know, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> similar to Java. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it was modeled on Java. It was a response, yeah. Microsoft's yeah. response to Java, but mm -hmm. uh, it was Entity Framework that actually broke me, uh, and it was like uh, lazy loading and Entity Framework, which didn't lazy load at all, and you had to actually oh. go check. And I just 
like yeah i had this whole i just uninstalled windows installed linux and like started looking around for my for my next language and stumbled across go and it was just the sheer simplicity and you mentioned it a few times in your in your chat it's like this is really simple and it's absolutely true like the whole ecosystem is simple it's like oh it's like a breath of fresh air because yeah as you say you you can if you want to look at what the standard library does you can just go and look at it and it's there and it's just oh it's awesome it's, and they, <laughs> they still have they still have quite good documentation for the standard yeah. library right yeah. don't but and if you don't understand an edge case yeah. Not to underestimate um, is the the uh, ability from the documentation with one click to go to the function yes. in the source code. Yes, exactly. That's, yeah. that's uh, yeah. that saved me so much yes. time yeah. because yeah. I just I, I I couldn't couldn't figure out how this this function would work. One click. Ah, okay. It just calls these two functions and and uh, processes it like this and and so on. And so, this thing, coming from coming from .NET, well, I mean Microsoft's documentation is awesome, but it lies uh, because yeah. there's a whole kind of layer of like kind of management bullshit about like this is what we'd like the API to do, but actually what it does. And like deep, deep, deep in tech net stuff, you'll find some comment from a developer saying, "Oh yeah, it doesn't actually do that. It does this instead." Uh, whereas Go, it's, it's like you click the thing and there's the source code. And this is actually what it's running. This is what actually is the standard library. And it's, the code doesn't lie. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm kind of, I know, I know it's deeply unpopular opinion, but I'm kind of dreading the, the advent of generics because it's going to take away somewhat of that simplicity. Yeah. yeah. And like I get why it's needed, but yeah, mm. I'm going to be... I mean the, the good thing is about generics um, that uh, we, we fought it a bit from the community yeah. that we don't get this crazy versions uh, that were a bit more clever and so on. And now it can be handled if we are good as a community. Uh, yeah. Not everybody is uh, doing everything generic now that uh, the users don't have to care. Right. If the yeah. if I do a normal HTTP uh, API somewhere, I probably don't have to care. Some things will be generic under the hood, uh, but I don't have to do at any type names anywhere or something. I can just use it the, the like normal functions and methods and so on, and it should. Work. So I'm not so concerned anymore about the generic. Like Ulo, Ulo, uh, so, sorry, uh, did you see the question in the chat? Oh, oh no. no, sorry. Okay, uh, uh, just so it doesn't uh, doesn't get lost. Uh, I I see. If I fully switched to uh, go, yes, I did. I switched like 2016, I think. Uh, I wrote my last line of Java and. <laughs> wow. Between in 2015, I started to switch, and and uh, then 2016, I I never really did Java. And I mean, still remember a lot of things, of course. And what I hear from some news, I think most of my knowledge is still valid. But uh, yeah, I, I don't say that I would be good for uh, doing a Java project today. Uh, do, do you uh, do you know the recording is still running? Do you want to? Ah, we no? can uh, stop. I mean, for me it's okay, uh, but maybe yeah, I, then I only hear if that someone question. doesn't want to be okay. heard. Or yeah, otherwise, exactly, if somebody doesn't want to be recorded anymore, or uh, we have more off topic, then then let's stop the recording, right? And you can still cut out things that. That yeah. Are questions. Yeah. Topic. So, so if if you are somehow in the recording and and feel uncomfortable with it, just write me or or Ole. Um, best via Meetup or or via a Slack, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. So can I ask? Um. So you said that uh, abstraction is mm -hmm. frowned upon, and um, mm -hmm. so you try to be very close to the bare metal. 
Um, can you elaborate on that? I thought like abstraction is a core skill and yeah. should be capable of doing. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is going some somehow against my beliefs. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. You you want some level of abstraction, right? But uh, as I come from the Java world, there you have abstractions more for the sake of having abstractions sometimes, and and uh, you have abstractions for abstractions, and, and then it's getting uh, really difficult. And in Go world, we have like uh, methods and functions and interfaces usually and and some simple types and well this is normally all the abstraction that we need right and sometimes we have uh, lambdas or these uh, function literals and that's already the the fancy stuff uh, kind of and we try not to do uh, too many too many layers of abstractions, right? We sometimes yes, we have especially pattern. when when the abstraction starts to hide complexity, yes. um, it's uh, frowned upon. Not like in uh, uh, like uh, use useful abstractions are one thing, but when when you have um, uh, uh, like a library where uh, adding an attribute changes the behavior of the library, for example. That's, uh, that's uh, especially uh, frowned upon. I mean, I've, I've worked in C-sharp as well. Um, and we had the fanciest bugs with um, frameworks that would just populate um, uh, fields in, in, uh, in classes just because they were there. Um, we, we had great things like circular uh, um, circular references that could never be garbage collected and such. It, it was awesome. Um, yeah, so so uh, Go tries or, or Go developers try to avoid this. Um, that said, it's possible to do this. So you um, even if you you go beyond uh, interfaces and and lambdas, uh, you can use the um, uh, the reflect package um, to uh, really dynamically um, create uh, um, create uh, um, uh, uh, constructs or or other types. Um, you can uh, populate fields. You can do all that, and there are libraries that do. But usually, they get into your way more than they help you. I've um, started. I've started seeing any any mention of reflect as being a code smell, like this. Yeah. yeah. And like if they, if you if you're importing reflect, then you're trying to do something that the type system doesn't really want you to do, and you're probably better off not doing it. <laughs> then then there's a one more extreme step. That's the unsafe package. Yeah. It's called unsafe for, yeah. for a reason because then you can <laughs> then then all security precautions from Go go overboard and you can just do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and, but you shouldn't. But stop. Yeah, you should. Stop. <laughs> there's, there's one library um, uh, that's called Monkey. It's been on Hacker News uh, recently. Um, that has a license that you can't use it. You can't use it for any purpose. And with what it does, it allows you to monkey patch um, methods or, or functions in Go oh, uh, by scary. manipulating, by like by remapping the code segments as writable, then uh, replacing uh, the first instruction with a jump to the monkey patched instruction. And yeah, don't 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 yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> this Com library, composition is your friend at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this library was an experiment, right? What would be technically <laughs> possible, and, yeah. and uh, to and, see, and also a statement use... to to never do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, that's why it has that. Uh, you can't use it uh, <laughs> license, and it's still used. So there are still hundreds of packages dependent on it. Hmm. I love it. So that's the other the other thing that Go has, or rather the Go community has, is this uh, 
anti-dependency uh, yeah. school of thought, which I also love. The whole kind of we we don't want left pad. The, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That whole thing that it's like, because I often like I hang out in uh, Argo Lang in the Reddit subreddit, for, <laughs> and it's like every every week there's at least four or five new gophers turning up, going like, "Hey, what framework should I use? And what packages yeah. should I be using?" And like, and there's all these old hands, crusty old people like me, and you can tell them because they mean they're like, "Just don't, just just use the standard library, honestly. Just you know, because you're going to go through the same learning curve that we all did, where you just import some gin or something like that, and you use this whole framework, and then and then you end up back at the standard library. So just just learn the standard library right from the start. And yeah, uh, yeah and it's sure. really like. I can see the whole, the popularity of Go is starting to to sway it more and more and more towards no no you should use these standard packages, like I see Gorilla Mux being absolutely standard for like if you're going to write a web server you have to use that and there's this awesome article which is just you don't need Gorilla Mux you just need a big fucking switch statement and uh, that's how to oh. do routing <laughs> and it's yeah. it's so right it's no. like, <laughs> and that to me is the kind of the, the more that this kind of Go simple. Like you really don't need a writer library. You just need a big fucking switch statement, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the standard library is really, um, really big. Yes. Like uh, really has a lot of, of functionality that you wouldn't find in other languages. Like you, you have a whole HTTP server. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, pre-built basically in the standard library yeah. and um yeah uh, similarly you, you have uh, encryption and hashing algorithms in the standard library that that's yeah. usually uh, only achieved via uh, uh, frameworks um yeah uh, or or in languages like java or c sharp just by the sheer age of them they have been implemented at some point in the in the in the standard libraries or standard packages um, yeah i mean i think it's mostly uh, like javascript uh, guys coming in who are just you know, there is no standard library for javascript you you use dependencies the entire time yeah. constantly dependent and you know a few hundred dependencies is absolutely normal for a javascript project and that's totally out of order for a Go project. Like you get half a dozen at most. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and could you also elaborate a little bit on um, what situations is good to use Go? I mean, like for you, obviously, every time. <laughs> um, like, 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 when do you have got good circumstances to use Go? And when should you, like, when is it maybe too much? Or, or what are like the typical cases to use Go? I mean, there are, there are a couple of core things where Go is used a lot for, right? The thing is, is the cloud stuff, right? If you're writing some cloud technology, it's often a good idea. Um, and what do you um, mean with cloud stuff? Like yeah, uh, AWS you, writing a service or, or me writing you know, a service? Writing AWS, right? <laughs> or something, some part of it, like something that's um, uh, routing traffic um, around or measuring yeah. things, so, routing log statements, whatever I mean, else you do as cloud. Originally, technology. Originally, Go was developed at Google for one specific problem. Um, they have that service dl.google.com where you download everything basically, like Chrome and and uh, I think updates for their their devices as well. Um, and that was a giant C++ monolith. And they had a problem that um, when they brought in new people, they basically had to train them for two months because before they could do anything on that code base. So um, they came up with the idea of an easy language uh, that has all that, um, all that, um, all those principles uh, that you need to to uh, efficiently uh, write uh, servers uh, already built into it, and uh, and all the concurrency uh, primitives basically uh, pre pre. Uh, um, yeah, pre-built, uh, so you c could just uh, use them as a part of the language. And um, 
so of course uh, that is uh, one of the core uh, core um, uses of go still like docker is written in go um, rocket is uh, written in go um, uh, parts of youtube are now written in go like they um, uh, uh, their shared databases uh, use a Go component to uh, organize uh, that, we test. Um, and in, in all kinds of other uh, cloud companies, Kubernetes is written in Go. So um, the ecosystem is already written in Go. And if you want to interact with it, uh, you will always find a Go uh, library that, that uh, already has the, uh, has the, the um, uh, yeah, the, the, the API abstracts the API for you. So uh, that's a, an easy choice there. Um, yeah, it's basically we, server, anything server-based. server, server based. Like if you want to yeah. write a desktop app, this Go is a really bad choice. If you want to write a, um, if you want to write an embedded what software. It, what was that, the first thing? If you want to write a desktop application. Oh, desktop. Uh, like there's there's fine, which is probably the best library for it's fine. It's like immediate it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's yeah, dog fires. It's this is fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I suggested that as the uh, official logo, but they rejected it. <laughs> but um yeah, like if you if you're gonna do uh, anything embedded, then the the um garbage collector just means you're going to get old random pauses and so that's not necessarily a great thing um, there's there's a whole bunch of things that is not really suitable for uh, I uh, I've seen like there's go for js which basically translates go into javascript and runs it on websites and I'm like what oh, the no. fuck would you do that for but anyway uh, yeah, but yeah. Is... <laughs> which is surprisingly well I have to tell yeah. you I know I know I bet, I bet it does great but it's just okay anyway <laughs> <laughs> not something you but, want to use uh, but service service it does awesomely for I mean, the whole concurrency stuff like every so you just write a, you just write a handler according to the standard description of the standard library's description of a handler and it will handle all the concurrency of like if you get four million requests in a second it will create four million um, go routines and it will hand each one of them a context which has that request and that response, and you can do all of that, and you just don't have to worry about the concurrency inside your code. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so um, that kind of stuff, it's great. And for servers, um, at least when you are running on Linux, it also uh, does that connection multiplexing. Yeah. Like um, it doesn't. Uh, um, uh, you you don't. Um, bombard the uh, operating system with uh, syscalls for the for the sockets um, but they are already uh, using that um uh i notify no uh what was it called e notify i, I don't know um, uh, that that notification uh, service from linux so um they are really really good really really efficient and the, the standard library uses htv2 where it can and all of yeah yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, things. Yeah, it's it's uh, crazy. What I also use it for is a uh, command line tools. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the other um, thing. Yeah. 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 So uh, from the really easy ones, uh, like uh, yeah, I I don't know, uh, um, uh, create a few files and start an application or something, and, and clean up afterwards. To um, I've uh, written for uh, my job. Um, basically a tool uh, that would automate a 20 minute manual process um, when we, we we were developing a device um, and uh, when you had a new version uh, in the um, in the uh, uh, falling out of the build pipeline you basically had to do uh, a 20 minute error prone process that could break the device. You had to start an uh, um, SFTP uh, or, or no, no TFTP server and um, copy files from here to there and, and set up keys on the device. Um, and uh, I found a package that could um, in Go that would just open that server or, or provide that server. And uh, basically, um, from there, I, I wrote uh, wrote a, a program that would 
uh, automatically download the, the newest build, uh, unpack it, uh, offer the right files under the right uh, file name for the TFTP server, and, and so on. So you, you, you can basically start um, start with a small command line command and, and uh, uh, just expand on it um, pretty, uh, pretty um, nicely. Do you, yep. can you, do you have like a suggestion, like is there a GitHub um, the repository of a, like easy to understand command line tool that was written in Go, uh, just to check uh, it out? Uh, I mean, Ole, you, do, you can, can you first, good question. I mean, there are many, but uh, you maybe first want to start with the Go tour, right? There's uh, on the web page, you can just go through the Go code where all the parts that are part of the Go language are uh, shown to you. And then you have already some you know the language itself, right? And then you can get into some tools. There are many, many uh, command line tools out there because they are usually quite easy to write and uh, will help us. And you should see what you like, what's interesting to you, what's right. And then uh, this can be can be great, right? If you find something that interests you and you see that you can uh, understand it and maybe even um, submit a patch or something yourself and work with it, this is nice. Cool, thank you guys. Unless, uh, Cobra is a suggestion here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Cobra is uh, uh, pretty, a pretty pretty big library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks huge. Though, though it's, it's, uh, uh, it's useful. I've not used it though. <laughs> I've been playing around with Unikernels and uh, Ops, which is the command line for Nano VMS. Uh, Unikernels uses it. And yeah, like the, I've been browsing around in their source code and the, yeah, the, the command line options just seem so easy. It's just like you do cover, 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 and then bang, that's the, that's the kind of setup. You've suddenly got all your command line options and that covers help and everything else. It was, yeah. Oh, so I was vaguely impressed. So. I've uh, written a small tool that can, uh, that requests uh, the, um uh, the departure times of buses and, and trains uh, in berlin for for uh, uh for um uh, uh, for a stop that you define so yeah. um, i can post this it's a little bit bigger tool and i'm not entirely um uh, uh um yeah, I, I, I don't entirely like the code, but uh, I'll, I'll post it. So the, I mean, there's the flags package, which uh, already provides pretty good. Um, I mean, that's your standard, but it's a bit like the yeah. logs package. Like I, I have a love hate relationship yeah. with, with, with the logs package. Like it's so yeah, simple um, and I, I get why it does, but oh, yeah. And it's the same with the flags package. Like I, it's really simple. It's really easy to use. It does exactly what it says on the tin, and I love that. But at the same time, like I'm, uh, like I'm constantly wishing that it could do a little bit more. So yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry guys, I have to run. Mm -hmm. uh, I can. I, I think we are just more chatting now, right? I just stopped the recording now. Sure. And <laughs> um, yeah, we can Thank still you. chat. A bit. Bye. Uh,